Good evening, everyone from Abu Dhabi. I'm Dr. Sabia Jamil, and you are watching 21st episode of Communication Talk, yet another exciting episode of Communication Talk. So if you are a communication and media researcher, and if you're looking for some new and innovative technique to reflect upon your research problem, you may think about arts-based research, or what we call ABR in the short form. So today we have three wonderful guests with us to reflect upon what exactly is arts-based research, um, how it is related to the media and communication research, what sort of challenges you may encounter while using it. This is all going to be discussed in this episode of Communication Talk. So very briefly, let me introduce our guest today. Our first guest of honor is Professor Nico Carpenter from Charles University, Czech Republic. He is the president of International Association of Media and Communication Research and definitely a mentor for all of us. Our second guest is Alexandra. He is the international co-chair of Media Information and Literacy uh, Alliance of UNESCO. And our third guest is Dr. Ivory Holton, who is the Associate Chair for Department of Communication, University of Ota. And Ivory is also a research coordinator for Center of Excellence, Ethical, Legal, Social Implication Research. So I would like to welcome all of you in this wonderful and exciting episode of Communication Talk. So starting with our first guest, Professor Nico, can you please enlighten all of us what is art-based research? Thanks, Sadia. Uh, yeah. uh, first of all, for the very kind introduction, uh, but also thanks to our organizers for bringing us together. If you don't horribly mind, I, I would like to use a PowerPoint uh, because then I can show things. So if the organizers or the host can give me the permission to use a PowerPoint, that will be helpful. Uh, do a screen yeah. share because now it's disabled. Can you share now, Nico? I'll give it a try. Yeah. Okay, we're good. Thank you so much. Okay, there we are. Uh, this is us. So always a good start uh, to show ourselves to ourselves. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I, I think in, in this case, talking about our space research, it's I think absolutely vital to at least explain what we are talking about uh, because it's in media and communication studies not very uh, common to be using this kind of research um, design methodology whatever we want to call it so let me quickly um, start with some examples and the uh, the whole how it began is is important because I think that I can give you some examples of how I've been using it to clarify what arts based research is. It started with a research project for me on Cyprus, uh, on uh, how community media play the role in uh, conflict transformation in peace building. Uh, I did what scholars do. I wrote a book. Uh, but at the same time, I, I was left when the book was, was finished with the question, what shall I do next? Um, how shall I deal with this knowledge that I gathered, that I produced? And how shall I do it in, the book was also very much about participation, how shall I do it in a participatory way? So that moment uh, was uh, the birth of Respublica. Uh, Respublica became a community media arts festival organized together with the people that I had been researching uh, with the objective, not just to communicate what was in the book, but actually to communicate the ideas behind the book and produce new ideas at the same time. Now, Respublica is probably responsible for half of my gray hairs uh, because it got totally out of control. Uh, we had one exhibition with uh, a group of digital uh, artists, activist artists, Chute Vector. We had another uh, exhibition with uh, 18 projects called Participation Matters. Uh, we had a third smaller one. Uh, we had a seminar series. We had a whole range of festival events on, on the island. Uh, most interesting for, for me was that in uh, one of these exhibitions, I could actually start experimenting 
with installation art. What I produced there was the Mirror Palace of Democracy, which was literally uh, a mirror palace uh, created, built in the basement of uh, an arts gallery, which was a theoretical reflection about the contingency of democracy. And that installation allowed visitors to go into that space and actually experience what the contingency of democracy, the confrontation of ideological struggles was. And for me, I think that was a fairly important moment in trying to grasp what ice-based research uh, could offer me as, uh, as a scholar. In parallel, there was a second project developing, which is called Iconoclastic Controversies. This is the book that is actually ready. Uh, it should come out in, in a couple of weeks. Uh, because when I was on the island, I also started to use photography to experiment with getting a better grip on the history of the island. If you want to do any kind of research on Cyprus, you really need to understand the history uh, and the history of the Cyprus problem in particular. But in order to do that, I started actually first documenting memorials, but then started working with these photographs to also create a separate narrative about how uh, we remember conflict and how particular hegemonic representations of conflict uh, persist for a very, very long time, even after the conflict turned out to be more, more latent. Uh, it is not gone, but it has become more latent. The third example uh, is maybe the strangest one. This is called Silencing Unsilencing Nature. Uh, we started working on environmental communication, uh, doing research in that area. And I got fascinated by how we as humans have been silencing nature for so many uh, centuries. And I started playing with strategies to unsilence nature, to give nature more of a voice. And we started using uh, the wolves uh, as, as, a, as an example, using photography, uh, but also using sound art to find ways of uh, producing a voice, even if it's still a human discourse, producing a voice for animals talking from their perspective. And that resulted in a series of workshops. Uh, this is in the Swedish art center in the Ferrigfabriken, uh, where we were working with a group of youngsters to unsilence particular plants, uh, plants that we call weeds that we discredit. Um, and in the last stage, we are actually working with uh, for preparing an exhibition in September uh, using a number of uh, photographs of wolves, uh, adding uh, wolf narratives to these photographs, where actually the wolves, who are extremely clever animals in these audio recordings, uh, lecture about Foucault, uh, about other philosophers, and actually explain us what it means to be a wolf, but from a fairly theoretical perspective. Anyway, all this was captured uh, in a special issue we, we published called Arts Based Research in Communication and Media Studies, which I think is one of the starting points of also this uh, seminar when we were planning it. I suggested the topic because of this special issue just coming out. So in that sense, a lot of the stuff that we'll be talking here was also condensed in that special issue. But just to give you a very quick overview of what's behind this interest in arts-based research. One simple idea, we academics, we do mostly two things. We write and we lecture, we speak. This is our hegemonic mode of communication. And just for the record, I have nothing against writing. I have nothing against books. I have nothing against articles. These are vital modes of communication for academics. But at the same time, I would like to argue that we can move beyond the written text, that we have other ways of both communicating and producing knowledge. And there are many, many different um, sort of experiments and traditions that have moved away from that written text. Science communication does that. Uh, knowledge exchange approaches, participatory action research, uh, multimodal academic communication, visual anthropology, visual sociology, they all move away from the hegemony of the written text. And one other 
version is arts-based research that also moves away from an exclusive use of the written text. And it's part of what some have called the artistic turn in social sciences, in, uh, in the humanities, with quite a number of publications that try to flesh out what arts-based research is about. And the very short version is in the Patricia's Levy, Patricia Levy's book title, Method Meets Art. It is a method used by uh, social scientists, by humanities scholars that use, activate artistic repertoires to both communicate academic knowledge and produce new academic knowledge. And this has a long history, but it became, uh, I think, quite uh, important in the past decade. Now, Levy argues that this is a separate paradigm next to the quantitative and qualitative paradigms. I think she's overstating the case slightly, but what she is arguing is that it is something special because it makes us feel knowledge. It is not about allowing people to read, to rationally grasp knowledge. It allows people to feel knowledge. And I think that as a idea is absolutely crucial. Now it's done in many different ways. If you look at Levy's table of contents, you'll find music there, you'll find dance, you'll find theater, drama, film, visual arts, all sorts of artistic repertoires that are being used. Uh, Levy herself has actually been, uh, been using novels, uh, another form of written text, to communicate academic knowledge. One last example, which I think is one of my favorites, it's a PhD from uh, seven years ago, um, Susani's PhD, which uses the comic as a, as a format to again organize a philosophical debate. Um, it's a PhD that was uh, presented at Columbia University a few years ago. So let me wrap up, so not to keep talking for too long. Why does this matter to us? This is my last slide. And there are a few answers. First, we can generate knowledge in ways that in communication and media studies, we haven't been doing too often. Uh, it, arts based research integrates the use of arts into knowledge production. And it allows us to produce new knowledge through experimenting with ways of doing, doing art in this case. It allows us to expand what we define as knowledge, because we can start thinking about knowledge as uh, something that also has an effective dimension. We can, thirdly, we can look at our identity, our subject position as academics, and we can see that we're and can be hybrids. We can combine different positions. We can be an academic and an artist at the same time. Sinner has called that artademics. I'm not sure if it's a perfect word. It sounds terrible, but it actually really captures the idea. Of course, we need to be careful. We should not sort of uh, instrumentalize the arts. It's not that it becomes a toolbox as we have many toolbox. It needs to be a respectful dialogue between that academic position and that artistic position, but it does allow us to move beyond what we are as academics, the kind of knowledge we regularly produce and communicate. And finally, it does allow us to reach audiences that are more diversified. It is not the solution to all. Obviously, the artistic world also has its restrictions in audience reach, but it does allow us to diversify our audiences. That's my introduction. I'll be happy to be, uh, first of all, on sharing my screen and then um, be very quiet and listen to the others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nico, for a wonderful presentation. And uh, I have been listening very first time about arts space research. So it was very insightful. Thank you so much. So I shall move to the second guest of uh, the episode today. Uh, Alexandra, the floor is yours. Can you share your thoughts about arts space research? Um, how does it relate with uh, communication and media research? And what are your experiences regarding it? For sure. Thank you, Sadia. Thank you. Thanks for the organizers. I'm very happy and proud to be with you. Happy to be with Nico and Avery as well. Uh, look, uh, I came from, uh, I'm a, I started as a practice junior. So uh, I, I worked in BBC for two years in London. And then when I moved back, I was 20 something, 20 years ago, 
to Brazil, uh, I, will start, I started with some journalists, my background is journalists, uh, to uh, develop a community experience based on art and media. Uh, we, used, we used to call a neighborhood as a school. Uh, and, and, it, and it is a, a Harvard case. Now, if you look at the Harvard case online, you can find it in Sao Paulo in Brazil. So uh, for me, I, I have never separated media and communication from art. Never, never, since my first beginning. And so I'm glad when I read, uh, um, when I read um, scholars and specialists and artists writing about it, I will share something because Nico encouraged me to, to share something today. Uh, I will share something really quick. But uh, what I mean is that um, after that, I started reading and research on art. And I check it out. That's not only my reality, but uh, the things are are really this border is really uh, it doesn't exist between media and art. In my experience, I will tell you why. Uh, I have two hats here. I'm wearing two hats. Uh, I'm director of Zeitgeist. It's my organization here in Brazil, where I am an advisor. I'm a lecturer too. I'm an academic too. I'm researching AI and ethics impacts on the Catholic University here. Nowadays, I'm a lecturer and I'm a scholar, but by that time I was not. And, and also I'm the co-chairman, international co-chairman of UNESCO Mill Alliance, when I work with media literacy with UNESCO Paris. It's a global network. So uh, I used, I love this Pierre Lévy, the French writer and thinker, a technology of intelligence. And he says that every phase that the humanity has passed through orality, image, written uh, worlds, and then digital technology means a way of print our intelligence within the world, uh, make our print within the world with, we're not a tool, but a culture. So uh, from my first start, I'd like to, to say that communication uh, and uh, art are culture and language for me. And they represent the spirit of the time. So Zeitgeist, which is my organization in German, it's a herd concept for spirit of the time, where I translate to contemporary. And I mean, uh, art and digital uh, are spirit of our time, the way we express and we actually move and change the world truly. So this is the lens through uh, in, in which true, I look through media literacy, for example. So just for the first beginning, uh, uh, I have a TV show about MIL here in Brazil to bring the subject for uh, a wider audience. And I make research and projects through Zeitgeist. Uh, in Zeitgeist, I research project development, teachers training and advocacy, as I do in, in UNESCO Mill Alliance within MIL. Uh, so this is a picture of Zeitgeist, we working together. And so as I said, Hoda used to criticize the ultra romantics German with the word Zeitgeist, saying that the art needs to represent the spirit of its time. So the Miron Discovolus needs to be built up only on the ancient Greek because represent the spirit of the man. But as we follow the time uh, today, uh, we don't know where the the things comes from because of the speed of the time, the simultaneously, the media. So I used to use art in this uh, way of express ourselves since we, we switch the, the, the mindset from this through this uh, as a society swift switch this, this, this mind, mindset from this through communication, through society, through economics, to politics. For this, we need to have a complexity in our sight for the world. This is from uh, this is from uh, uh, Edgar Morin, the French thinker. We need to respond with complexity for a complex world. So we did not separate disciplines and subjects in, in boxes, but try to integrate them and treat them uh, as a complex view of reality. So when I address MIL, media literacy, for my students, in my books, in my lectures, I address as a complex 
uh, bowl of, of culture that we need to mix up art, culture, communication, digital, mass media, digital media, because mass media is still alive. <laughs> it's still alive and kicking. We don't have only a digital media. And Pierre Levy says everything is still alive. We need to deal with everything right now. This is a, one sign of contemporaneity. So uh, we, we check we are in a Gutenberg Zuckerberg dilemma right now because we, now we address specific issues. Uh, uh, we have this confusion. So for UNESCO media and information literacy, now using my UNESCO hat, uh, is the role and function uh, is to understand, to analyze and to use media to self-expression, to analyze, uh, to produce, uh, and to be critical uh, learners and thinkers, to participate within the professional world, the governance, the economic, the democratic process of our societies. So uh, MIL through UNESCO, it's, a, it's an umbrella concept. So we are not only dealing with television in a very instrumental approach or radio, which is the very first mass media in the instrumental. Approach. We need to cite it with a more complex view within this umbrella that art-based research should be underneath this umbrella as well, as a part of this mix of concepts that we use. For example, I'm, I'm researching AI and ethics impact right now in university, but I think MIO it's an onion that we need to fill. And when we talk about the first layer of this onion is a social network. But as soon as start to peel it, we get through philosophy, we get through our representation in media, our representation in the world, the way we express ourselves. So this is where art starts to be based in, yeah? So I brought this example just quick. Uh, this is a Brazilian artist during the eighties, he used to represent he used to put actors wearing a TV custom where they filmed themselves beneath this custom and broadcast themselves on a TV set on the head. So it represents how TV was present uh, during the 80s, for example, in education or societies. Yeah. So this is culture. This is art representing the state of our mind, the, the, the state of our culture. Yeah. And nowadays, of the human show, the reality show brings a lot of things uh, from us uh, uh, as well. Uh, and so I'll jump all the things uh, I used to, I mentioned here Pierre Levy, and I used to mention Yuk Hui just to finish because Yuk Hui is a, a, it's a Chinese, uh, actually from Hong Kong, from Taiwan, uh, and but he studied in US, philosopher, engineer, that he says technology needs to be diverse and needs to reflect, reflects culture at the same time, it needs to reflect art, yeah? I'm saying all of this because uh, my base are semiotics. And through semiology, there is no difference between science. Uh, science communicate. It can be a painting or it can be a, a, a radio show. We are communicating all the time. Uh, so uh, for AI, for example, I would jump all of this. Adam Harvey, this American artist who lives in Berlin, are starting to embed AI within art. Uh, for example, this picture, it's uh, about this makeup to avoid surveillance on uh, private cameras. So if you use this makeup through the cameras, you cannot be cataloged or you cannot be recognized on, on cameras. This is to, to try to, to avoid AI and surveillance. So the artists start to dialogue with the spirit of the time, with the zeitgeist. So uh, Adam Harvey has another, a lot of other uh, works. So I'll just leave my contact here. I have a lot of things to, to talk about UNESCO, but I I'll, I'll like, I'll like to listen to every and, and also to listen to the audience. This is my TV show, uh, and those are my contacts. Uh, I, I, I do also, I, I do believe that arts and media are based on culture. It was ex extinct in the beginning of my career, but as soon as I started to read and to research, I used to treat MIL and to look through MIL to media and information literacy with uh, representing uh, art and media with a reflex of the spirit of the time we were living in. 
So this is what I address to you. Thank you. I'm sorry to take Thank you, Alexandra. A, a long time. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. It was really interesting um, to listen to your presentation. Um, uh, now we have third year, Dr. Ivory. Uh, uh, Ivory, the floor is yours, and we would love to see your uh, presentation, or you would like to share some thoughts about arts-based research, and then I shall move for the question and answer session with the guest. Sure, thank you. Thanks so much. And as everybody can see, I'm, I'm tucked away in a Jeep right now. <laughs> I'm in Utah. I'm doing some <laughs> on extremely windy outside. So if you see the the vehicle move, um, that is real life right now. But I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for all the coordinators and organizers. A lot has gone into this. And thank you too for Nico and Alexander for, for your presentations. Um, I don't have a presentation, so I've, I've yielded some of my time. But what I would like to say um, is a, a couple of things about what, um, what my engagement in this area has been and how that's developed. And, and also to make some broad calls that fall in line with what um, Nico and Alexander have presented. And I'll start off by uh, relaying a story. Um, one, I should note that I too was a, a journalist for about 15 years. And a lot of my journalism uh, was at, at conflict at times with what is art versus journalism and, and thinking dichotomously that they had to be separate. And that began to change um, once I moved into academia. How could I bring them together? How could we merge those together in, in a way that was meaningful? not only for me personally, but for potential audiences. And so this is a particularly important and significant topic for me. But the story I wanna convey is uh, that the first time I heard about um, a theoretical concept or construct of cascading networks and what that means and, and how that's looked at uh, within society and especially on, on digital constructs. And this idea that um, essentially one person can have an influence on many and those many can have an influence on many more and it can be difficult, or at least it was for me, coming from journalism um, into this theoretical world to understand what that looked like and the, the impact that had. And so we had an instructor that took us uh, outside. This is at the campus of UT Austin on a fairly rainy day. And we stood uh, next to a spigot that was dropping just little droplets of water. And he let us you know, feel the water and said, okay, you can feel the effect. You can see the water, you see where it's coming from. It's coming through the spigot. Um, and then had us move out into the actual storm and we're getting drenched. And he said, now you're, you're in the network, you're there, you're living it. Uh, and, and for me, it was an example of how powerful it can be when we really start to live or present ways to live theories or concepts or constructs, um, which is why it's, it's so great to see some of the art that Alexander presented as well, because it, it brings things home and makes them feel very personal. And so for me, what I've started trying to do in my research is think about ways to connect the research in, in, in a meaningful, powerful way for either the community or other individuals who aren't just in that hegemonic structure that, that Nico mentioned, that help us break outside of those constructs. And I'll provide two examples and then hopefully we can just talk. One of those examples uh, comes from about five years ago with some work that I did with UT Austin's Virtual Reality Lab. And they have a great homepage I won't be able to pull it up right now because of my connection, but I invite everybody to go there. It's just UT Austin Virtual Reality Lab, and they show off many of their projects. But what they were trying to do at the time was connect with different schools of thought and different programs and disciplines on campus. And one of the great ideas they had was uh, the, the restructuring of historical uh, places that had been burned down, that had been lost to time, um, and to also offer within that some sort of uh, connection to theory and thought of the artist. And so through the help of, of, of researchers, academics, uh, historians, journalists, they reconstructed multiple museums for walkthroughs, artistic walkthroughs, where we could put on headsets um, and be part of the art. And then as a second layer, walk into the art and experience it in three dimension while listening to a story about the artist and, and, and what it meant, not just the artist, not just the technique, but what it meant to be that artist at that time period. So this sort of multi-level connection, immersive connection that I thought was just beautiful. Um, and to be able to take the words and take the research that I was doing and give that to other folks and watch it come to life as art really reminded me that you don't always have to be gifted with the brush stroke or you don't always have to be gifted uh, with a computer or digital design to create art or to be involved in art 
in a meaningful way that connects it with, with the research that we're doing. The second I'll mention is a project I'm working on now that I'd be happy to hear uh, more thoughts on. In, in journalism studies, there's a push now to look at uh, the impact that social media has or has had and continues to have on journalists. And in particular, right now, we're seeing a, a trend in the US and, and perhaps globally of women journalists or individuals who identify as women journalists uh, leaving the profession because they feel burned out. They feel uh, disrespected, harassed, all, all sorts of things. And so several colleagues uh, and, and myself, so Valerie Blair-Gagnon, who's at Minnesota, uh, Logan Molino, who is at Temple, Diana Basio, who's at Swinburne in Australia, we've started looking at the ways that uh, that harassment against women forms on, on Twitter and, and what that means. So that's sort of the research approach of talking to people to understand what that looks like, of looking at um, data that we've collected to see the different forms of harassment. And what we found is that there are multiple forms of harassment targeted specifically to women and that they follow a pathway of sort of this joking off-color uh, comment to uh, more critical focused commentary personal attacks and then they escalate even further some line, sometimes to offline harassment which can be extremely scary for, for anyone and we're taking that and have applied and will continue to apply for grant funding through the National Endowment for Humanities and other resources to develop a space similar to what Nico showed in the mirror space where people can walk in and experience the tweets, can experience the words, can hear them audible. And so having tweets read, and we see that sometimes as comedic banter where tweets are being read by celebrities and, and they're funny, but in this case, to really start to feel what the journalists feel. Um, because it's, it's, it's one thing to see the words written and the tweets shared. It's another to be researching them and trying to put them into context, but it's something altogether dimensionally different to be able to walk into a space and to hear words raining down on you, um, to see all of the tweets coming at you and to walk through and, and experience that. And then as part of that experience, trying to come up with and formulate a way where that digital experience moves into the offline the real world experience. And we've, we've looked at a few different ways to do that so far. And, and one of the ways we've imagined is sort of a break space where you're flooded with social media and, and the tweets and the harassment. You sort of walk into a breathing room and you feel okay because you're able to turn off the device and walk away from it. But as soon as you step outside, that harasser is there. They're there confronting you. And so there is no room to breathe. There is no turning this off. And to, to borrow Alfred Hamida's term, it's ambient, it's always there. So we've gone from this ambient news space to this ambient journalism space to what has now become an ambient harassment space that these journalists, particularly women journalists face. So it's, it's a project that we're working on and it was so great to, to see many of the reminders of what we could do with, with Nico's uh, work and also with Alexander. So I will yield the rest of my time and look forward to our, our Q&A and thank you again to the, the presenters. This is absolutely fantastic, so thank you. Thank you, Avery. Thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, so moving ahead to the question and answer session, um, uh, my first question is with Professor Nico. Uh, Nico, may I ask a question to you, starting from you? Is that okay? Of course. All right. So that's a question from me. And as well as I have received the same question from three undergrad students. Uh, and uh, the question is about, for example, if we are not interested in arts, let's say, and we have traditional research methods like uh, qualitative, quantitative methods, and these are the things that we keep on talking, mostly in undergrad courses. So if you are not from an artistic background, maybe since childhood, so is it going to be like a tough thing to adopt arts-based research method? Um, yeah, I mean... <laughs> that, that's a hell of a question. Um... Uh, maybe the starting point would be is that nobody should force to be should be forced to use a particular method or a particular approach. Uh, right? There's a diversity of approaches, and that characterizes academia. There's something called academic freedom, and that also applies yeah. to methods and approaches yeah. and paradigms. 
you can't force people and we should never force people into a particular tradition. I think that's the biggest, yeah. most important thing. What I talk about, and I think what uh, Alexander and, and Avery talk about is a way to enrich the options we have, not yeah. to force people into doing something particular where they feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Is it easy if you then want to do it? No, nothing is easy. Quantitative research is also not easy, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> it requires training and practice, patience. And there's there's always a little bit, when we talk about methods, there's always a little bit of pain involved. It really takes an effort to yeah. get into something. Uh, but once you do, once you learn, um, uh, that could be um, learning trial by error. There are many different ways of learning, but I think once you've learned, you notice how rewarding and refreshing and fun it can be. You also notice that there are limitations. It's not perfect. It's not answering every possible question, but it, it takes an effort. Yes, of course, but people shouldn't be forced to do this for, it would be a terrible idea. Okay, uh, my second question is about um, picking up from the presentation of Alex Bentra, and I would like all of you to respond back to this question. If art is a culture, and if you are coming from a context where we do face cultural restrictions, what can be possible um, challenges for art-based research, particularly when you have issues of freedom of expression, freedom of expression for artistic expression, so uh, that we do have context where we do face problems with artistic expression. So I would like the response from all of you, um, your brief comments regarding that. Nico, maybe you can go ahead with the first um, answer and then we will ask Alexandra and Ivory for the same question. Yeah, the, it, it gives the others a bit of time to think because this also is a, a, a tough question to ask. <laughs> You're asking tough questions. That's good. Okay. Uh, no complaints there. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a general point. Uh, we often deal with restrictions on freedom of speech, whether that's artistic freedom, academic freedom, we often face them. Some regions are worse than others, but they're always there. Um, different degrees and I mean I should not as talking from from Prague in, in Europe I mean uh, we're in a luxurious position because we can uh, speak fairly openly uh, mm -hmm. but there are always restrictions and I think one of our jobs as let's call it what it is as intellectuals yeah. one of our jobs is to find ways to speak yeah. and what I think arts-based research and uh, artistic research in general even, what it allows us to do is sometimes to um, write between the lines, use metaphors that are not always extremely obvious, yeah. uh, that are open to interpretation because arts is much more open to, to interpretation. It gives us ways mm -hmm. to, to channel our thoughts and to communicate them that maybe sometimes as a journalist or as a, an academic, you even can't even write down but yes, there are also restrictions to um, artistic approaches. And I think that my argument is if we start combining all these options, mm -hmm. we just find more ways uh, to communicate in difficult circumstances as well. So I see it in a more positive way as options, yeah. as ways of bypassing power to speak truth to power, right? Yeah. And I think that is vital. Okay. Alexandra, what are your thoughts about arts and culture and if you face cultural restrictions to do this kind of research? Thanks. Look, the Latin America has been passed through 30 years of dictatorial ship movement, so mm -hmm. we have a lot of experience in it <laughs> to share. Uh, we have grown, for example, we have the experience to be, have grown the alternative media a lot, even before the digital media. When I mean it's fanzines, alternative uh, newspapers, um, uh, and other, other, other stuff, graffiti. Why not graffiti too? Uh, so uh, I've been to the plenary of opening the World, of Press, the World Press Freedom Day on the last May the 3rd. And that was, there's one, one discussion within UNESCO that is very connected what you asked us. Uh, if we think about uh, freedom of expression and press freedom, 
and media literacy. What should come first? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is a question that values exactly. $1 million. But uh, the thing that I advocate during the plenary, uh, uh, it was that they need to have a symbiotic relationship as biology. Mm -hmm. They need to exchange. So, for example, we, we cannot say that, for example, uh, art should not exist if there is no freedom of expression. Mm. It's a stupidity. You must practice art even between the lines, as, as Nico said, yeah. to break through yeah. freedom of expression, to get freedom of expression. So with MIL, it's the same thing. Media literacy is important. It's so important as freedom of press freedom or freedom of expression because as you have uh, people expressing themselves, we need to have ready to understand to understand the science, to understand disinformation, to understand misinformation, to understand fake news, to explain legitimate expression uh, and this kind of thing. So what I think about it is that you cannot uh, separate things. Uh, art needs to exist yeah. whatever in the world, but in, in some places it needs to be a, an important, it is an important way to break through freedom of expression. Uh, but in other parts of the world, it drinks through freedom of expression to strength its force. But depends where we are. For example, we are in a democratic uh, uh, regime now in Brazil, formally. But we have a president that shows he's a little bit a dictatorship, a dictator sometimes. So what do we do? We produce art to protest against it. And sometimes he puts all the democratic and, and, and legitimate system like uh, the Supreme Court through someone who tried to express itself. And what's this equation? What's this dilemma? You need to continue producing. You need to continue expressing yourself. So it's a matter that freedom of expression and art needs to a symbiosis as well, a symbiotic relationship where they need to exchange all the time and make the land and the atmosphere, the ecosystem uh, good to grow up freedom of expression, for example. Thank you, Alexandra. I Ivory, Ivory, what are your thoughts for the same question? How do you see freedom of expression, art and culture? Yeah, so, such a great question and, and good responses, interesting responses to listen to so far. I think, um, at least for me, I have a very privileged perspective being in the U.S. and, and having this sort of positionality. Yes. But mm -hmm. what I would say, one, one of the things that we have gone up against and that we've thought about with our NEH applications are accessibility points. Um, and, and some of that brings into uh, focus culture and cultural sensitivities, but more so here, uh, there are two main issues for that. One is the idea of embracing techno diversity uh, that, that we mentioned earlier, not just in the actual expression of art, but in the way it's experienced. So if we are going to build out as, as an example, again, this sort of Twitter sphere of harassment, how do we build that in such a way that everyone can experience that and have a, a personal experience, whether it's free, whether it's the access point, uh, if we're requiring a, a digital device to look at this or experience it, how do we get that into the hands of, of everyone um, so they can experience that? And then how do we recognize that um, at the core of, of that techno diversity experience, um, it, it, it's shaped by an individual's experience with the very devices or technology or the cultural um, introspection into the technology. And what does that mean for the creator, the experiencer, uh, and the deliverer in some case, especially in the US yeah. who's backing these installations and art and, and what that looks like. And the second is temporality, the, the, the temp temporal nature of some art. Some art is meant to be very fleeting. Right? We see art all the time that's uh, created to be destroyed, um, or in some cases destroyed to be created. But what of these sort of digital aspects that, that we have the opportunity to um, make accessible over time, or to find ways that they are accessible and cataloged in a way that is meaningful for those behind us, right? coming up behind us, so that they have a temporal existence that then embeds itself within that, that cultural experience that, that we're talking about. So those are just two sort of a uh, little off the beaten pathway things to think about as well. All right, to wrap up the program, Ivory,
how do you see the future of arts-based research? And I will come back to Alexandra and Nico to wrap up the program, but starting with you, how do you see the future of this type of research? Yeah, I, I like that we're going to the person who's the newest to it to, to ask mm. the, the big question. <laughs> um, I, would, I would say that maybe that's what we're looking at, right? So um, mm. through the work of, of Nico and, and Alexander and many others, we're starting to, at least for me and, and some of my colleagues, see arts-based research as a means to uh, express um, our work differently, to experience it in, in different and meaningful ways, to connect it, to, to take that experience and connect the work with community. And community can be anything, right? Community can be uh, people who also drive Jeeps. It can be people hmm. who uh, are, are students. It can be a community that's um, you know looking at LGBTQ plus issues. And the work that we're doing may be important, but often as, as scholars, it, it, it falls on deaf ears or it falls on similar ears and we, we get stuck in a silo or different bubbles and it doesn't really go anywhere or do that kind of good that, that it could. So for me, as a very personal response, it's a way of uh, expressing, it's a way of experiencing and it's a way of connecting it in, in, a, in a way now that's more meaningful and more important than ever, right? Especially when we, in the US at least, have a very polarized uh, society right now based around uh, politics or health issues, we also have the opportunity to continue to build and connect community. And that doesn't usually happen through a research paper. Uh, it doesn't usually happen through a simple conference talk, although sometimes they're very good talks. It happens through experience. It happens through connectivity. It happens through community building. And that's what this kind of um, research approach can do. Thank you, Ivory. Thank you. Wonderful. Alexandra, your brief comments for the future of uh, arts-based research, and then I will request Professor Nico for his final brief comments to wrap up the program. Thank you. I make Ivory's word mine because uh, my thought is, comes on to this direction. Uh, listen, I think we need to reconnect uh, learning, reconnect subjects. I work a lot with K-12 schools. And in schools, uh, we can uh, to rebuild the connection between uh, different uh, kind of knowledge, uh, not separate any more maths to language, because math is language, actually. Uh, not more separate uh, media, uh, media studi studio from art studio or words from images. Uh, we live in a very complex world and contemporary is, 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 is very big. It's, it's, it's one characteristic of the contemporary that things are not separated anymore. In, in education, in curricula, we need to force this. When I was mentioned uh, this uh, first experience I had in the, in the neighborhood as a school, uh, and I mentioned uh, 20 years ago, the idea is it's, it was a school but we not divide subjects. We learn through projects and through projects involving art, media, science, uh, language and everything. So in this way, uh, art, art studies has a, a specific characteristic to be a kind of enzyme or a catalyzer of the process. Uh, if you take the example of Adam Harvey that I just showing you that artist. He's a, science, a, a data scientist. Uh, he used to create the pools of the, the magnets of, of, of social network. He recreated the pools using metadata because they blur their pools on Google Maps. And, 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 and Adam Harvey used uh, metadata to rebuild the pools, the swimming pools within the Google Map, only using metadata to show that they build up that pools with our, our data. So they need to show their pools. So he's a scientist, he's an artist. So we live in this kind of world. We need to, that schools, we need to learn within this kind of complex site with a concept from Edgar Mohan that I brought you. And it's a concept that came from maths, actually, that came from mathematics, the complexity. We need to look it through complex, complexity. And art, studi art studies has a special role in this for me. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you and Professor Nico, 
how do you foresee the future of art-based research? Your final wrap-up remarks for this episode. Well, uh, thanks also to my previous two speakers, because I think they answered in, in the most marvelous ways. Um, and in a way, I think I, I can almost use their answers to provide you with my answer. When Avery said, I'm new to this. Um, I think the project that he was talking about, about ambient har harassment is absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is exactly the kind of research I think we, we need to experiment with. And we see new people coming into this field, starting to think about, hey, how can we make people experience our knowledge? Mm -hmm. And I think that that is crucial. It's, it's for me evidence that our based research is here to stay. And I think what Alexander brings in is not something I talk too much about, but is absolutely vital. It's the connection between, um, say, the world of, of the arts and learning and arts-based research and learning. And I think that is also a, a, a vital reason why uh, I think arts-based research has opportunities. It moves away from the very traditional ways of, of learning because of its emphasis on experience, which is so vital as an instrument in the learning process. Um, so I think these two points that <laughs> were in a way raised almost in embodied ways in, in, mm. uh, in Alexander's and Avery's talks, they are absolutely vital. I think that arts-based research is here to stay. I don't think it will ever become the dominant model. I also don't think it should become a dominant model. I think it should be one of the options that we use, uh, part of our portfolio. But behind that, I think is this absolutely vital idea that the universities do not have the hegemony on knowledge production. Often in, in a university, people believe that we're the center of knowledge production. We're not, we're one of the centers, but the arts, um, civil society, the world of business, they're also centers of knowledge production. And what we need is these alliances uh, in, moving forward, actually creating uh, alliances that allow us to produce more and better knowledge, uh, more than we're doing now. Because I think knowledge is needed more than ever, right? If you talk about the, the nationalists, the populist madness we're, we're living in, um, there are reasons for producing knowledge as one of the tools we have to counter this, this kind of, uh, of madness. There are pitfalls. I think we should be careful at the same time. I think we don't want to contribute to uh, a, a, what some have called the de-alphabetization of society, where all of a sudden writing becomes totally insignificant and uh, image is the only thing that matters. We should be careful there. We should protect academia. It's not that we, we all stop being academics and now have to become artists. We have to protect the university as one of these absolutely vital centers in knowledge production. So we should be careful. I mean, if you start changing these huge equations, you can do a lot of damage if you do it in the wrong way. But if you do it in a respectful and wise way, I, th I think there is a future for us, arts based research, which looks quite bright, I think. Thank you, Nico. I'm very grateful to uh, all of our three guests today. And uh, trust me, you have inspired me a lot. I think I'm going to pick up one of the books to start reading about arts-based research. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much. And I'm already receiving wonderful feedbacks on your presentations, uh, whoever is watching live now. So thank you, all of you. Do take good care of yourself. And I hope to listen all of you very soon in any of the forthcoming events. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you as well. Ciao. Thanks a lot.